Hello to everyone who's joining us. We're really delighted to have you here. Um, I'm going to jump straight into the introductions just while our Zoom room fills up a little bit because I want to make the most of the time that we have with our speaker today, Professor Lena Haldanius. My name is Victoria Adelman and I work on the Digital Welfare State and Human Rights Project at New York University School of Law. And I'm really delighted to welcome you to our event on cashlessness in Sweden. This event is part of a series of conversations on digital government and human rights. And we've been running this series for two years now. This is the 13th episode. It's um, really great to see some familiar names in the virtual audience that's joining us here on Zoom already. And for those of you who are joining this conversation series for the first time, a very warm welcome to you. In each of the conversations within this series, my colleagues and I interview an expert about a specific case study on digitalization in the public sector. We go in depth into the case study, aiming to introduce a wide audience of academics, technologists, and other practitioners to the implications of that digitalization initiative for human rights. So far, we've looked at case studies spanning from China's social credit system to the European Union's introduction of digital technologies into its border control operations, for example. And within each of the conversations, we aim to highlight some of the parallels between the harms and the implications of the digitalization of government all around the world. You can find the recordings of all our previous events in this series on our webpage. And on that webpage, you can also find summary blog posts, additional reading materials, and a series of guest blogs by academics and practitioners. We're hoping that these materials and resources can provide a helpful repository of information for anyone who's interested in learning more about these topics. So in today's conversation, we're looking to Sweden, a country which is transitioning away from cash faster than any other country in the world. So right now in Sweden, many shops and restaurants declare themselves cash-free zones. A person can only board a bus if they can use a cashless method of payment. And over half of bank branches no longer accept any cash deposits. So without a bank account or means to make payments via a card or a smartphone, individuals are becoming increasingly locked out of the economy and then further marginalized as they're unable to access certain services or goods. With our speaker today, we're going to delve into the lived experiences of the groups who are excluded, looking at the serious human rights implications of this rapid transition to cashlessness. But it's also interesting to focus on Sweden within this conversation, because banks have been the providers of national ID cards in Sweden for decades. And today, the main digitalized ID system that the majority of individuals use to access different online public and private services is called bank ID, and it's provided by commercial banks. So private banks are mediating access to services, while they're also gaining increasing power as the transition to cashlessness is deeply tied to the privatization of the payments market. So in today's conversation, we're going to focus not only on the transition to cashlessness and the exclusions it entails, but we're also going to briefly connect this to the wider role um, and power of banks in Swedish society. Those of you who have attended events in this Transformer State series in the past will realize that this topic of conversation stands out a little bit from previous conversations. Um, previously, we've focused on case studies where governments have introduced new digital initiatives, and we've discussed the implications of that digital government initiative. But today, we're looking instead at a sovereign public function, the issuance of money and provision of payment infrastructure, and looking at how that public function is being taken over by the private sector through digitalization, and in the process, it's eroding the role of the state in that key function. We're going to have an audience Q&A in the last 15 minutes of this webinar, and we encourage you to send in questions using the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen and to send questions before quarter to the hour so that we don't get a kind of crush of questions at the end. I want to hand over now to my colleague, Caitlin Choffey, who's a research scholar on the Digital Welfare State and Human Rights Project at NYU School of Law and leads our work on digital ID systems. Over to you, Caitlin. Great, thanks, Victoria. Um, it's my pleasure today to be able to introduce our guest, Professor Lena Haldanius. Uh, 
Lena is Professor of Human Rights Studies at Lund University in Sweden, and her academic background is in law and practical philosophy. Lena's previous research has focused on the intersection of political philosophy with areas such as rights, feminism, and economic inequality, among many other topics, and she also teaches on human rights theory. Last year, Lena launched a new research initiative entitled The Cash Project, and this project examines how the transition to a cashless economy impacts economically and socially vulnerable groups. So welcome, Lena. It's great to have you here with us today. And I can see already from the participants that we're joined by quite an international audience. So I wonder if we could start the conversation by very briefly talking about what cashlessness looks like in Sweden. What exactly do we mean when we talk about a transition to a cashless economy? What is replacing cash in people's everyday lives? And Victoria mentioned that at the top, some of the places that we've seen this happen, but could you talk a bit about what kinds of places and services have we really seen this transition take place where there's a new refusal to take cash today? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Victoria and, and, and Caitlin for, uh, for inviting me to this event. So yeah, so Sweden, like many other countries has transitioned gradually away from from cash use since well i'll say since the 1960s uh, with the introduction of credit cards and debit cards but also with much larger groups being banked in the sense of having current current accounts in in, in banks uh, lately uh, online payments of course and other digital payments have become much more common but cash has up until quite recently remained as a possible mode of payment throughout uh, the economy. Um, but the development away from cash sped up further some 10 years ago in Sweden with the introduction of a smartphone app called Swish, uh, which is issued jointly by some of the major commercial banks. Uh, and originally, uh, the point of this, pay of this app was to facilitate transfer of small sums of money between private uh, individuals. So I owe you $10, I can swish you the $10 instead of giving you a $10 bill. Uh, but it is now also a payment app uh, that you can use in stores and for online, uh, on online shopping. And Swish, I think, really changed how people relate to money. Uh, so you see now, for instance, even quite small children who have their own smartphones will get their weekly allowance on Swish rather than in, in cash. Um, and um, so for people with, an, with a bank account, a smartphone and the technological know-how, I would say that Swish largely made cash irrelevant or un unnecessary for uh, daily use. Um, and in the wake of that, what has happened is that uh, as you hinted in, in your introduction there, that more and more stores and services, including public transport, uh, don't accept cash at all as payment. Uh, and public transport was actually the first out of the out of the block on the, this, where they replaced cash payments with a kind of a top up card, uh, which is has also now been discontinued. Uh, but Originally, I would say small independent shops and cafes stopped accepting cash because their cash flow was quite small. Maybe they, it's only one individual person working in the stores. There was also the issue of security. Um, and um, there is a reasonable argument there that in independent shops and, and cafes, there is a security risk to staff in dealing with cash. But now also... The, what has happened over the, uh, just over the last few years is that also large department stores and, and further public services no longer accept cash at all. Uh, and crucially in Sweden, there is no law requiring businesses to accept cash. It is regarded as a matter of contract. Um, so when, when we now say cashlessness, in a sense, cashlessness is maybe a misnomer. It's fairly easy to access cash in, in Sweden. Uh, but it is increasingly difficult to spend it. So if cash is the only money you have, uh, you will find it very difficult uh, to, to get around in Swedish society today. Yeah, I think it's something we've seen in a lot of other digital developments, that there's a sort of a catalytic app or a catalytic company that can help trigger some of these big changes. And we often start the transformer state conversation by talking a bit about 
the vision behind the development and to try and understand why a certain product or a certain technology is being introduced. So I wonder if you could help us kind of deconstruct the vision behind this transition to cashlessness in Sweden. Um, we've seen in other cases, you know, arguments around modernity and convenience play a really prominent role. Sometimes it's about questions of fraud or security, as you highlighted just now. Um, but what have been the major justifications for this transition? You know, who have been the major actors? Is it yeah. apps like Swish? Um, and perhaps maybe just to add on a, a final question here, maybe if you could give us your take on what are some of the genuine benefits of cashlessness that maybe you've seen in Sweden so far? Yeah. So if, if, I, if I start with that, with that last question, what the benefits of cashlessness are, because I think that the transition is driven partly by the fact that the cashless economy is for a majority of uh, the people in Sweden, just very convenient and has become the normal way of, of, uh, of, uh, of shopping and interacting and being a consumer. Uh, it's convenient, it's quick. You don't need to think about whether you have the right amount of money on you. Uh, it reduces risk for staff, like I said, also reduces risk of, of mugging. Um, so for, for anyone who is on the inside of this, uh, the cashless economy uh, has, I think, become a reality uh, for very practical uh, reasons. Uh, and when the discussion started about this, when, when the, you, you began to hear critical voices about possible uh, negative side effects of the cashless economy, I think for, for most of us in Sweden, we already lived cashless lives because cash was simply not needed. Uh, anymore uh, in our daily lives. Um, but if I go back to your, your first question there about the vision uh, behind the cashless economy, I would say certainly in Sweden, there is a digitization vision, uh, uh, which is uh, driven by the state. Uh, there is an explicit aim uh, by the Swedish uh, government that Sweden aims to be the best in the world in digitization. Uh, there is certainly that kind of self-image of Swedes as early adopters of new technology. That is also something that we want to project onto the world, that that is uh, sort of distinctive of Sweden, that we are at the front of these kinds of, of developments. That's very much part of the, of the brand, if you will, of, um, uh, of Sweden in the world. Um, but the, the cashless economy in itself is not an official or state goal. Um, but there is, it is sort of tied into other things. There is a lot of faith in innovation generally. There is a lot of faith in the general benefits of digitization to facilitate everyday life and to make public services efficient and, and accessible. There's also a lot of faith in market solution uh, so it is part of the official digitization strategy that the state shall step in only when and where the market proves insufficient in providing for digital services and uh, other you know, electronic services. But the move away from cash specifically, that particular trend uh, is not the state's vision. It is the commercial bank's vision. Uh, and um, the state sort of monitors this development uh, lately with some trepidation, and we could maybe come back to that. Uh, as I just said, there's no law stopping this from happening, which I think is not deliberate. I think that is just the fact that no one really saw this coming, so that there was no sort of um, uh, inkling that there would be any need for, for uh, legislation requiring businesses to accept cash. Uh, but the cashless economy has been the vision of commercial banks in Sweden since the 1960s. And there is a new study uh, done into the history of, of banking in Sweden, particularly relating to uh, cash cashless economy and also the relationship between economy and identity uh, by my uh, colleague Orsi Hus at Uppsala University. She's an historian of economics. Um, so the banks had this vision early on with the introduction of credit cards uh, and checkbooks, uh, cash would be redundant. 
and everyone would use the plastic card and the plastic card might even double as their identity identification document. Um, it didn't happen then. Uh, they certainly hope it will happen now. Uh, and so this, I would say, is in the Swedish context, completely driven by commercial interests, by the banks, but also by uh, by stores and services that find that this is convenient and cheaper. Uh, Sweden is a is an elongated but sparsely populated country. So just also distributing cash throughout the country uh, is um, is a complex infrastructure. So if you can. If you no longer need to do that, uh, that is also a sort of a regarded as a um, um, as a benefit in efficiency. Uh, this transition towards cashlessness, I should also say, sped up further uh, during the COVID pandemic, uh, when many stores that had previously uh, accepted cash stopped doing so and cited reasons of hygiene and and minimizing the risk of infection in you know dealing with uh, with with cash money um and that is also something i think that maybe we can come back to the the sort of the association between cash and sort of dirt and risk uh that uh that that came out of that so it's 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 driven by commercial interest and it is facilitated uh by by the state, and it has taken hold now as sort of the efficient way of organizing the payment system. And the government has certainly a digitization strategy, but not explicitly regarding cash. Thank you so much, Lena. You've touched on so many interesting themes there, and we'll definitely come back to some of those, especially you know the private sector pushing some of these digitalization trends forward and this notion of the state and the law kind of trying to catch up is um, is really going to be something to talk about in today's conversation. But first, I want to go to a kind of central theme in um, this in this conversation, and that is of exclusion. You mentioned what this is like for the majority and those on the inside, as you said, and I want to kind of go now to um, those on the outside as such. Mm -hmm. So many of us might think of older people or people with disabilities as being likely to struggle with the transition to cashlessness and the introduction of these new technologies. Um, and you've been doing empirical research with various groups to examine the implications of the transition to cashlessness. So can yeah. you tell us about some of the individuals and the groups that you've interviewed and you know who is especially excluded here? Yeah. Yeah. So when we started planning, uh, uh, my colleague uh, and me started planning this, the empirical part of this project on, on, on cashlessness, uh, we used indicators that are already existing in research on digital exclusion, where there is some knowledge already about uh, what groups that are uh, vulnerable to digital exclusion generally. And the cash question is a bit specific, but it, it is part of the wider problem of, of the digital divide, of course. Uh, so uh, age uh, and disability, like you mentioned, are known uh, indicators of, uh, of digital exclusion and also of cash dependence. Uh, also migration status, uh, living rurally, um, but also socioeconomic vulnerability, um, being homeless, uh, poor, just being on low income. Uh, and this was uh, made explicit also in a big review that was done a couple of years ago in the UK, uh, the Access to Cash Review, which also found that poverty is in fact the largest indicator of cash dependence. Uh, and that was um, um, sort of latched onto our concerns. So the to the extent cash dependence was discussed as a problem in Sweden, that was usually uh, in relation to the elderly and to people with disabilities. And these are large groups of people and uh, who often are not heard and whose interests are not always taken into account. And cashless payments clearly um, was a, a very real problem uh, for some of the elderly who for various reasons, I mean, there's in intersection uh, intersectionality, of course, also between age and, and, and disability. Um, and 
there were problems just dealing with the technology, uh, understanding the, the technology, feeling comfortable uh, with the technology. Um, and of course, the solution to those to the problem of digital exclusion or cash dependence for these kinds of groups is often believed to be that you make the technology better, you make the technology easier to use, you make it simpler, more accessible. Um, that is a simplification. I don't think that it holds up to scrutiny uh, as a complete uh, solution, but it's also not completely unfounded. Um, and this is so. So this is crucially um, important for these large groups. In our project, we were more specifically interested in the group that no one was was talking about, which uh, is people who live in socioeconomic vulnerability uh, for various reasons, um, poverty, homelessness, um, lack of economic control for other reasons, for instance, because of your, your domestic situation, or crucially in Sweden, uh, if you lack citizenship or you lack right of residency, uh, you don't have a personal ID number. Uh, the personal ID number in Sweden is absolutely crucial for you to be able to do pretty much anything. Um, if you don't have a personal ID number, you cannot be banked. Uh, so if you live in an insecure migration um, situation, for instance, you, you cannot uh, get a bank account because you don't have the personal ID number. Um, and there had been hardly any attention on uh, on the impact for these groups on uh, the transition away from cash. And we had a hunch that, you know, these sort of normal, normal ideas about possible solutions, you know, better technology, easier technology uh, would certainly not be the solution for, for for groups whose main problem perhaps is uh is is poverty or just living very unorganized or marginalized lives uh, and we found that there was a general lack of knowledge and specifically of qualitative data uh on the experiences of what it is like to live cash dependent lives in a high-tech country uh, like sweden where the development happens so quickly and where the sort of the imagined uh, user of the payment systems um, is a you know a, a tech savvy person who moves easily um, um, easily uses apps and things and and we had a sense that there is a large group of people here who are just left by the wayside and no one knows uh, very much about what their experiences are so that's why we choose to focus on socioeconomically vulnerable people and of course as I said before. Uh, there is intersectionality here. So in that group of, of uh, socioeconomically vulnerable people, uh, there is also a sort of large proportion of them are either in insecure migration situation, uh, uh, have disabilities or are elderly. So we sort of, so we get an intersection there, I think, through that focus on, um, on the complexity of this, uh, of this group. Thank you very much for painting that, that picture of the variety of groups that are excluded and especially pointing to the issue of migration status being tied to the ID number, which itself is tied to banking. We can imagine that that leads to quite a sort of severe exclusion across the board. Yeah. Um, so I wonder if you can tell us a little bit about what that exclusion looks like in practice. What kind of examples have you been seeing and lived experiences? Mm. Well, uh... But some things that we learned when we when we started interviewing, first, I should say that uh, if you do interviews like this, uh, the particularly if you, if you interview vulnerable people with a human rights approach, uh, you need to be very careful so that you don't let your good intentions uh, mean that you that you set research ethical questions aside uh it's there are there are examples of that you know where where uh, you think that the good intentions of the human rights scholar sort of trumps research ethical concerns it's very important to abide very strictly uh, by that so that you don't exploit people uh so we went through organizations uh in our uh, local region uh who work with people who 
likely to be cash dependent. So homeless people, asylum seekers, migrant women, low income families and people with disabilities. So we started interviewing representatives or, or volunteers in, uh, in these kinds of organizations from their experiences of working with these groups. Uh, and then we use these organizations as sort of ways in or as gatekeepers so that we, we got contact with um, cash dependent uh, people to interview through organizations that these individuals trust. Uh, so it's very important that you don't just uh, walk out into the street and start interviewing homeless people about money. Um, so um, we also, the interviews that we have done so far are then with, with representatives of organizations, uh, voluntary organizations, and the group that the group of cash dependent people that we have interviewed so far are people on the very uh, sort of low end of socioeconomic vulnerability. So people who are who attend who go to who are homeless, um, who um, uh, live on the street, um, who get by through begging or selling things in the street. Uh, survive by something by by sometimes selling drugs and other uh, illicit goods uh, so the people that we have talked to so far are really very socioeconomically uh, vulnerable um, some of them are are so-called eu migrants which means that they are citizens of another eu country and come to sweden for limited periods of time uh, and uh, uh, live uh, through um, soliciting in the street uh, and stay for for the for a duration of a couple of months. Uh, there are uh, mental health issues also uh, among this group. So so that should be understood when I talk about our findings that this is a group which is marginalised uh, in society for all sorts of reasons. Uh, we also plan for interviews with people who are low income, but who don't have other social um, social issues, if you will. Uh, we haven't got to that yet. So that is the next round of, of interviews that we will uh, that we will be doing. So some things that we learned from the interviews that we have done so far. Uh, is that. It's always important to remember that the people who are everyone who is negatively affected by a cashless economy are people who are disadvantaged already for all sorts of reasons so this adds to an already problematic or precarious life situation uh, for them disadvantages cluster as we know so there's a kind of a pylon effect uh, and most noteworthy, I think, across the board from the interviews that we have done is a sense of being disconnected, of being left by the wayside in a society where things happen very quickly. And in their life world, the economic world that they live in, uh, sort of stands still while the rest of society is moving ahead. Uh, so it's not only a matter of of what modes of payment you can use and what can you buy and what can you not buy. It's like there are sort of two temporalities going on where, where the sort of the, the outside of society, the cashless economy is, you know, on the move, things happening quickly, where they are, uh, they are, they are not in that time frame. Um, so some people we talk to don't have bank accounts at all, um, live completely, um, uh, cash by hand. Some do have bank accounts. Some also have bank cards that they could pay with, but they live in a situation where the uh, any little extra thing can be overwhelming. So you know, also even if if they could pay uh, with uh, with as I said with a bank card, even that can be overwhelming. They can't remember the pin number. You know, you you lose your card. You're afraid of losing it. You don't quite trust it. Um, the card expires and you don't know how to get a new one. Uh, so there's a lot of anxiety. It's also something that we found. There's a lot of anxiety around money uh, when the money is not bills in your hand and coins in your hand. It's something else that you don't quite understand and that you feel is controlled by someone else. Um, now, one very interesting thing that we found was that we also needed to readjust our own mindset because we used to think in terms of poor people being locked out of the economy. Uh, 
maybe it's it's more uh, informative to say that these people are locked in. They are locked into a very restricted and small economic sphere, uh, sort of cash-based islands, if you will, where cash works almost like a local currency. You know, within that small circles that they move in, uh, that is completely cash-based. Uh, so you move between the cafe that takes cash, the grocery store that takes cash, and the charity shops for everything everything else that you need to buy. Uh, so the more stores around you that stop accepting cash, the smaller this cash-based island that you live in becomes, more restricted it becomes. And this is completely binary, you know, you're in or you're out. And the exclusion from the cashless world around them is, is just complete. Um, so to our initial surprise, many of the interviewees had not really thought about something that we thought that they would have noticed, which was that during the pandemic, as I said before, more and more stores stopped accepting uh, cash as payment. So we thought, well, what did you think about this development during the COVID pandemic? And many of them hadn't noticed that at all because this, this change during the pandemic happened mainly in stores that this particular group would not frequent anyway. They were too swanky or too expensive. Uh, so that also told us that this the social stigma of being sort of the wrong kind of customer in the wrong kind of store is not only to do with modes of payment, it's also to do with where you feel comfortable being. Um, so I think generally the cashless economy adds to an already existing sense of being disconnected from society, but also from time, as I said before, that things cha change around them and they can't relate to that. Um, and there is another very important, I think crucially important thing regarding time, which is how time consuming it is to be cash dependent uh, in a society which is going cashless. I mean, in our digital lives, those of us who use digital technology all the time, we can do several things at the same time. You know, we shop online while we sit on the bus or we manage our bank account while we which, what, watch our kids play or, or whatever. We do things simultaneously. Uh, but if you are cash dependent, uh, you don't have online services. Uh, you can only do one economic thing at a time. So it's, it's very time consuming in that sense to be cash dependent as it is time consuming to be poor. Uh, and also crucially going back to what was mentioned earlier that uh, if public transport, uh, if the buses don't take cash uh, and it's very difficult, sometimes impossible for you to, to, to take the bus to anywhere, you need to walk. So if the stores around you don't take cash and you need to go to that other store across town to get whatever it is you need for your children or whatever, uh, then all of this takes time. So it's, it's also very, very time consuming. And that is, is a thing that, uh, that I think is very difficult for those of us who are in the digital world uh, to realize. Um, the last thing I think maybe to, to highlight is also how the suspicion, and uh, there was a lot of suspicion uh, among the, the people that we talked to, suspicion and cynicism towards the authorities, you know, so I mean, I said before that the transition towards cashlessness is not driven by the state, uh, but for these users, for these people, um, that is all the same, you know, the state, the banks, uh, the authorities, uh, that, that, that world that they feel completely disconnected from is just sort of one monolith of power to which they have no access. Uh, so these are people who already have sometimes for, for very good reasons um, suspicion uh, towards uh, towards society in general to authorities in particular they have taken many beatings before um, they were also very aware many of them about they talked about Sweden's self-image sort of one interviewee that we talked to said that this is this is modern Sweden they want to be modern and um uh, they could not see themselves uh, in that and said that we are the little people that uh, that that they don't that they don't care about. Uh, 
they were very explicit about that, how they felt that the, the, they are left by the wayside. They talked about freedom of choice, supposedly so important, freedom of choice, and said that. So why is the, the why is paying with cash or being able to pay with cash, why is that choice not important? Uh, was what one one person said to us. So the choice to pay with cash, why is that choice not important? Well, the informant answered their own question by saying that this choice is important only for the little people, uh, for uh, for the poor people who live marginalized lives. And what is important to them is not important uh, on the on the general scheme of things. So there was a very strong sense of being disconnected from uh, from things happening and and uh, the this little cash based bubble being very, very separate from everything else that is going on. Yeah, I think that I mean, I thank you so much for that. I think it really demonstrates the tremendous value that this kind of empirical research can have because of the richness that it shows of how people are experiencing some of these digital transformations and some of the kind of unexpected consequences for people. I think this idea of being locked in is very evocative that there's a kind of bubble or an island where people are being kind of concentrated and where disadvantage can be not just reclustered and kind of exacerbated, um, but really kind of intensified through the use of these, these digital technologies. Yeah. Uh, maybe just to, to turn a little bit to something that you just mentioned and to bring back to the, the beginning of the conversation where Victoria had mentioned the idea of bank ID. And mm -hmm. I think this question of identity has come up several times throughout this conversation about, yeah. you know, not just your personal identity, but also systems of identification, the use of the personal ID number. It's something we've certainly seen a deeply embedded part of any sort of digital transformation is this question of how are people identifying themselves digitally? And I know in Sweden, the bank ID has been in use for many years now and has become a part of kind of everyday life and integrated with many different services. So I wonder, could you tell us a bit more about the bank ID system and maybe also related a bit to how that has affected exclusion to how it has been used in different services and how it kind of connects to this transition to cashless as well. Yeah, so um, people are sometimes surprised when they hear that it, that uh, the bank ID or the electronic ID is issued by commercial banks in Sweden. That goes back to uh, uh, that goes back several decades, where uh, in since the nineteen sixties, it has been banks largely that has issued identification, uh, and that was uh, due to a. A, a, an identification crisis that happened in the in the 1960s, 1970s, when more people started using checkbooks and and paying with cards, that uh, stores uh, required of banks to solve the identification problem that was created when sort of normal working people started using checks and 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 bank cards, and that's when banks started issuing identification in order to solve the identification problem that their own um, um, initiatives to make people pay uh, with cards or checks had created for stores. Uh, so that that identification documents are issued by banks has been normal in Sweden uh, for for 50 years. Uh, and I think that the specifics, you know, of, of banks issuing electronic IDs, IDs and why people think that is perfectly normal here has to be seen uh, against that against that background. Uh, now, of course, that means now that uh, if you don't have a bank account, uh, you can't get an electronic ID uh, from a bank. Um, and uh, uh, so that and considering that more and more online services use the bank ID as the way for you to log into the service uh, ro rather than using a username or a, or, a, or a password, you use your bank ID to access services. And many think that this is perfectly, I mean, this is, this is great because it's so convenient because you only need to remember, you know, one login uh, for everything. Uh, but if you don't have a bank account, if you don't have a bank ID, you will then also be locked out of these online services. There has, there is now very recently come a um, a uh, uh, another electronic ID system which is not connected to the banks because it became so obvious that this was a uh, 
a, a, a crucial ex exclusion factor. But that alternative is still quite small. It's not as widely accepted as, as bank IDs. But there is an awareness now that the fact that commercial banks issues, uh, the electronic identification uh, has very serious exclusionary um, uh, effects. Yeah, and I think it ties also to a question that often comes up in these discussions, which is about privatization and the role that private actors like commercial banks are playing in authenticating identity and in, uh, in helping to determine who gets access to certain public services. So could you talk a little bit more about this privatization element, specifically vis-a-vis -vis the role of the state? So what have been some of the the connections between the role of banks or other private actors um, thinking about specifically public services and what have maybe been some of the tension points between the role that private actors should play versus the role that the state should play? Yeah, I think that in, in, in Sweden traditionally there is a sort of very thin line um, <laughs> between the state and the corporate interest. Uh, th this has been uh, throughout the 20th century. I think there has been sort of a, a, a public perception that, uh, that the government and the big corporations in Swedish society have, have sort of the same interests uh, at heart. So there is, a, as I said earlier, also there's a lot of faith in, in market solution. And you might say a naive trust uh, in uh, the goodwill of uh, of of the corporate or the commercial interest that that is a s significant I think generally uh, for for Sweden uh, and of course this is true across the board globally that digitization means of of the economy means privatization of the uh, of the economy and the payment infrastructure cash is the only kind of payment that does not go through a commercial bank or any kind of or uh, commercial agent. Um, there is currently a review working on behalf of the Swedish government on the question of the role of the state on the payment market. There is like a belated awareness that uh, things are sort of getting a bit out of hand uh, and that state the state needs to take back um, some control over the payment market from the state. So because the control has moved from the state uh, to banks. Uh, and one question included in this review is what it means for something to be legal tender. Um, so, um, and whether legislation is needed to secure it. I mean, cash is nominally legal tender in Sweden, but if you cannot use it and if commercial entities can decide whether they are willing to exclude, to accept it as payment or as uh, a means to settle a debt or not, then that throws doubt on whether cash really is legal tender. Uh, in the Swedish economy, so that is 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 sort of a, a startling realization. I think that this privatization has come to that that maybe the state issued money, cash, uh, no longer works as legal tender in large sections of the Swedish economy, and this is a worry. This has become a worry. Uh, so there is also now a uh, the Swedish Riksbank, the General Bank of Sweden, uh, is really, I think the from the from a sort of state point of view, uh, the main initiator of of uh, various measures to try to wrestle back some control from from banks uh, to the state, and one sign of that is that they have issued a project on a digital currency, the e krona, uh, uh, which would then be a, a digital currency, but issued by the state through the the Bank of Sweden rather than through commercial banks. That is. There's no, no decisions taken uh, on that yet, but that is going on. And of course, e-currency, digital currencies are projects that go on in many countries in the world. And in, in Sweden, I think it is a response to the fact that uh, the, uh, the control over the payment infrastructure has slipped away from the state to the commercial interests and thus to the to the to the private uh, the private interest, it's very very obvious that this transition towards cashlessness has shifted the balances of power over the payment infrastructure away from the state towards the commercial interest. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you so much. That's that's really fascinating and a kind of really crucial part of this picture. Um, we're going to go to the Q&A from the audience in just a couple of minutes, but I wanted to pick up um, in a final question, kind of pick up on this notion of the role of the state by shifting us to think about the role for human rights here, which of course yeah. are centrally focused on states' obligations, and you are a professor of human rights studies. Yeah. So I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about um, what a human rights based approach adds in comparison to other frames in your mind um, and you know whether you think that existing human rights norms are sufficient in this context or whether alternative rights new rights alternative framings are desirable in this kind of context yeah uh, I, I think that uh, the going into this discussion uh, or this question with a human rights framework shifts the perception of what it is that is going on. Uh, I think that we need a much more nuanced and empirically informed conception of human rights, uh, of, of economic rights, I meant to say, so that economic rights is not conceived only in terms of economic subsistence or other conceptions where economic rights is about minimum or threshold levels. Economic rights need to be about the circumstances of inclusion in the economy, being able to participate on equal terms in economic activity. Uh, so if in a digital economy you cannot pay without being banked, then being banked has to be an economic right, right? So I think that we need to rethink what an economic, economic right is. And also if, if not being banked, not having access to digital, um, to the digital markets, also means that you cannot access public services. If you, if you have trouble accessing online healthcare services because you don't have a, a bank ID, uh, then this also affects your status as a citizen. Uh, so uh, the digital exclusion, the exclusion from the cashless economy affects not only your economic rights to be an economic participant in society, it also affects your, if it affects your interactions with the, with the sort of public society, the public sector, vital public services like, like healthcare, then it is also a violation of your of, of your rights as a citizen. Uh, so I think that this shows that our theories and conceptions about human rights, both political and, and, and socioeconomic rights, need to be grounded in empirical knowledge about what it is like to live disadvantaged lives how disadvantages cluster and how that affects what a right has to mean for vulnerable people in order to make sense and in order to actually uh, facilitate uh, their everyday lives. So th that is one thing that I think is crucial and, and that the arguments that are the ones that get mainly get traction in these debates are about security and efficiency. Uh, and, and those are important, but arguments about justice and the fact that policy changes and policy developments have adverse effects for those who are most vulnerable, for those who are worst off, it affects their rights negatively, while it affects the more privileged people's rights positively, um, needs to be taken into account and not, in, not only taken into account as one factor, but recognized as an obligation of justice to make sure that digitization um, actually violates the economic rights of, of vulnerable people. Thank you so much. And I'm going to tie that to some of the questions that we're getting from the audience, if that's OK. And I will put two questions to you at a time so in the interest of time. So firstly, we have a couple of questions about um, what can be done? What should the state be doing? What kinds of laws are required? So one question is whether it's now time for countries to enact a law um, such as the sort of Digital Information Non-Discrimination Act, um, which makes individuals not required to use digital ID and digital means to secure services, etc., and not be discriminated against in failure to have digital ID or mm. sort of digital means of payment. So that's kind of one question. And then quite a few questions touch on the questions of monitoring, tracking, privacy, um, surveillance. So several people are asking whether um, there have been concerns raised about state or corporate tracking or surveillance of individuals based on um, these cashless methods. And specifically whether you, know, you have any comments about what data is gathered in the context of Sweden, who has access to that data and whether the government is kind of using or planning to use some of this data about transactions 
yeah uh, well thank you for these uh, excellent questions of course it is it is vital to remember that cash payment is the only anonymous way of paying and what has happened certainly in the political discourse in sweden is that paying anonymously which you might say should be a a right if you want if, if you wanted to do that has become regarded with suspicion so if you want to pay anonymously with cash then sort of it's 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 um there has to be something wrong with you because why would you not be a, you know able to be upfront with what you're paying for uh so i think there is a shift in discourse uh such that the privacy that comes with being paid with with the ability to pay without leaving any digital traces has become a source of suspicion rather than uh, regarded as something that people should be entitled to. So I do think uh, I completely agree with the suggestion there before that uh, we need uh, probably need some kind of, of legislation or official recognition that uh, that uh, being excluded from vital services on the basis of whether you are digitally included or not, uh, should be regarded as a form of discrimination. Uh, I completely agree with that. And I think also that monitoring, um, well, uh, the, 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 the people that we have interviewed so far, um, they are very afraid of this. Uh, and sometimes for good, for good reasons. Of course, the, what, the kind of data that is, that is collected about us when we do uh, transactions or just move along online, we know that uh, loads of data is collected and that this data is also capital. Uh, this is a very valuable, uh, valuable resource in the, digital, in the digital world. And that is an enormous uh, integrity uh, risk uh, that I think that most of us are very naive about. Uh, we leave digital traces uh, all over the place, but if you are vulnerable already, or if you are dependent upon um, uh, state authorities uh, for your basic subsistence, uh, then this indeed is a risk. So I completely agree that uh, the legal framework for this, also what counts as discrimination and what makes the privacy in the digital economy uh, not only important, but how, how how it can be protected better. I completely agree with that, and certainly uh, from a human rights point of view. Yeah, we did have a, a question that I think you've kind of already touched on, which is whether we need to rethink the categories of prohibited discrimination in international human rights treaties to encompass different forms of algorithmic discrimination. So based on categories that we hadn't previously thought of, things like access to a mobile phone, you mentioned a couple of others. Yeah. So it, it would be great to hear if you have further thoughts on that. And maybe I'll add in a, a second question as well, which comes from a, a person who's working with exclu digitally excluded communities in the UK, where they've encountered a lot of the same issues, um, mm -hmm. but there are active civil society groups and some academics working on it. So it's been able to gain some political traction and this person is wondering, what does that look like in Sweden? Is there a kind of political response, civil society or academic response? What is the kind of the political state of these issues in Sweden yeah. right now? Yeah, well, I think that uh, re regarding that second question about the digital exclusion and the awareness uh, of that, I think that there is, there is some, uh, not, not enough. I still think that there's too much faith put in this being something that will solve itself because we are now in a period of transition and the new generation knows all about technology. Uh, smartphones will become a, you know, uh, a thing that everyone has. And I think there is an, an underestimation of the uh, economic costs and the, the certainly now with the cost of living crisis, uh, it's, uh, it is increasingly difficult. Uh, for people just to afford it. So I think that once digital resources, digital technology becomes almost necessary for anyone to function, not only as a consumer, but also as a citizen in a highly digitized uh, society, then that cannot be up to individual people's or families' private uh, economy, whether you can participate in that. It has to be part of the social official infrastructure that you have access to whatever technologies is required for you to function uh, 
uh, effectively, but also e on equal terms uh, in society. So we certainly need to rethink uh, the private public boundary also uh, for this should absolutely necessary digital technology be just any other sort of consumer product on a market or do we need to rethink this as a public resource rather than as a rather than as a private good thank you very much and, and just in our final few minutes uh, i'll just sort of take one final question from the audience um it's actually a sort of two-part question firstly just in terms of establishing facts what kind of percentage of the swedish economy is cashless do you have a sense of of that kind of um percentage you talked about the vast majority majority yeah. um and then secondly have you encountered interviewees who intentionally opt out of the digitization movement and for lack of a better term maybe see themselves as rebels or proud resistors to the digitization of society and the power of banks yeah so the 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 percentages not my strong suit perhaps i don't i, I think that uh certainly in uh uh, uh I think up to like 90% of economic transactions uh, are cashless. Uh, and there was a uh, sort of survey being done a couple of years ago where people were asked whether they could manage without cash. So this, was not, this was not about actual use, uh, but if people could manage without cash. And at that stage, that was maybe two years ago or something, so it could have shifted already. Um, about 70% of people said that they could manage without cash. This is self-reported, so we don't know exactly, but that still means that uh, some 30% of the population say that they cannot manage without cash. And that could be uh, an absolutely that they absolutely cannot. It can also be that they don't want to uh, or that it would be very difficult uh, but it's certainly a sense that there is quite a large proportion of people who actually do not manage without cash. Uh, and uh, crucially, of course, I think within within that percentage, um, you find people who are disadvantaged uh, for all sorts of reasons, like we have just discussed. Uh, but with that that other point of people who have voluntarily opt out of the uh, of this um yeah, there are some who do, um, and that is a different kind of group that it also would be interesting to to talk to. We haven't done so yet. Certainly that that you can also from a socioeconomically quite sound position, just for ideological reasons or whatever, choose to sort of live, to, to pay with cash just as a, maybe as a means of resistance to this development or something. But actually also in our group that we interviewed, people who are uh, poor and live economically marginalized lives, there were still some people who sort of almost proudly said, you know, that, well, I can talk about this uh, insightfully because I am I am an outsider. I look at society from the outside. I'm an artist, some said, you know, that uh, so they some of them regarded themselves as not as rebels exactly, but as uh, sort of proudly occupying a position on the margin of society and looking at all the queernesses that that that, that is going on uh, and I think that this could have been this could have been desperate defiance that could be an element of that but there was certainly also among some of the people who live desperately difficult lives a sense of pride also and a very re great reluctance to portray themselves as victims in this development. Thank you so much, Lena. I'm afraid we're going to have to leave it there as we're coming up to the hour. Thank you for this incredibly rich and interesting um, discussion. It's been wonderful speaking with you. Um, thank you, you to so everyone much. as well who has um, attended. And I've just posted a link in the Zoom chat to the um, Transform Estate series webpage where the recording of this conversation will be uploaded and you can find all of the previous conversations. So thank you very much again. And enjoy Thank the rest you of the very much for having me. Thank everyone who's been listening that I can't see. Thank you. Bye.